uh, from Wisconsin. Uh, Tim's been a model railroader since he was 12 years old um, when he convinced his dad to get into the hobby with him. He is a member of the Wisconsin and Michigan uh, Model Railroad Club and also a member of River Rail, River Rail out of La Crosse, Wisconsin. We have Dave Berman, the great Dave Berman of the grain, uh, to thank uh, for, for having Tim with us. Um, and so, Tim, welcome uh, to NMRAX. Thank you. It's my first clinic with NMRA, so thanks for having me. Cool. So if you want to, just, if you can share your presentation. Uh, Sounds to, good. We'll just uh, launch the PowerPoint here and we'll be good to go. Can we see that? Yeah, we're seeing that. That's all great. Very good. So um, I've been uh, very fortunate that I've gotten to know a number of people with the railroad car ferry operation over Lake Michigan. I've been part of the Estes City of Milwaukee group. Uh, for a while, and uh, I've uh, known a lot of guys who have modeled the boats, who worked the boats, who have switched out the boats. So this is a lot of the fruits of knowing a lot of the people who are really experts in these things. And just a little sketch of the Lake Michigan Car Ferry operation centered out of Kewanee, Wisconsin. I'm actually modeling this on my layout, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, what I'm up to that way as well. So first question is, why haul railroad cars across Lake Michigan? Well, back in the day, it was a lot faster to go across the lake than through Chicago. Uh, back then, you had all the waybills and stuff, and it could take a week or more. You get any kind of snow in Chicago, it would take multiple weeks to get a railroad car through Chicago. And so the lakes provided a four-hour shortcut um, straight across. And this connection also allowed the Ann Arbor, Pier Marquette, CNO um, on the Michigan side, and of course, the Green Bay and Western, Sioux and Milwaukee on the Wisconsin side, to have increased haul models, haul miles, and added traffic, and created a really new and fast and flexible east-west railroad corridor, just really streamlined to uh, serving the customers. And then, of course, for any any guy, boats and trains, what's not to love? But a brief history: the service actually started in 1892 with the first purpose-built wooden car ferry, named the Ann Arbor One, of course, built by the Ann Arbor Railroad, um, as it would later be known. And this service ran between Kiwani and Frankfurt. So actually Kiwani was one of the first uh, port, if you will, on the Wisconsin side. In 1897, the Pier Marquette got in the action and built a steel car, steel car ferry, 260 feet. Of course, uh, the later boats would be anywhere from 360 to 430 feet long. And they also started working in Kiwani a number of years uh, after that. In the 1920s and 30s, was really a boom time with a lot of new boats being built. In fact, in the 1930s, the city of Flint set a record for 1,010 crossings made in one year with 101,000 miles being traveled. Uh, these boats were icebreaker class and they ran in all weather and they just kept going back and forth. World War II also saw a great increase uh, in the number of boats and crossings. So here's a map uh, from the Ann Arbor Railroad uh, during that time period. You can see the connection um, basically between Frankfurt and Kiwani, linking the uh, east and west. And here's actually a shot of that original boat, the Ann Arbor One. Again, it was made out of wood. In fact, the hull was made out of oak, and the guys talk about how it used to really flex, especially in ice. And here's a shot of it uh, in the 1890s being switched out by uh, Green Bay Western 440. Here's another shot from the 1890s. And again, you can see the, the 440 steam engine there. And the whole thing was made out of wood. And uh, to the right as well, you can see the Ann Arbor II. One interesting thing is you can see the square plated windows to the right that these early boats had. Of course, both being made completely out of wood. In 1905, we had the Ann Arbor V starting to run. This was a steel boat that the Ann Arbor built. And one thing you'll notice is that the apron actually has a bit of an incline to it because the boat isn't full yet. So it's not that low in the water at this point. And uh, here's another shot from 1908 showing the early Kiwani Peninsula and yard. And uh, you have another Ann Arbor boat there sitting there. And uh, again, 440s for the KGB and W switching it out. And just moving forward into the 1950s then, um, here's a publicity shot that was done of the Kiwani Ferry Yard and Dock. 
So in the 40s uh, and later, you actually had a seven track yard as seen in this picture with two slips. And the way the tracks were numbered is towards the Lake Michigan side, which is the right side of the image, uh, would have been track nine and then all the way through slip one. So seven yards and two slips. And in this picture as well, you have an Ann Arbor boat uh, on that back slip, slip one. And then the slip closest uh, to the bottom of the image is a uh, Pierre Marquette CNO boat, probably the city of Flint is what it looks like. Also on the peninsula um, is a Coast Guard station. And you can see that white structure uh, with the little cupola there, it's a Coast Guard station. You also notice a bunch of automobiles lined up next to the city of Flint. And that's because the railroad cars would, or the railroad uh, car fares actually haul uh, passenger cars and passengers across the lake as well. So they would actually line up the cars. And as soon as the railroad cars were on, they would drive all the automobiles. And many of the boats had planking in the back of the boat that they could actually park the cars over the rails. This is a really cool shot uh, from uh, 1922. And you can just see uh, Ann Arbor 7 uh, on the right and then a Pierre Marquette boat on the left. And just uh, the Ann Arbor boat is actually in one of the docks in the slips. And then the Pierre Marquette boat is, is coming out. Here's a shot from 1948, again, still under steam. And you can see there's two boats uh, in the slips. There's Pierre Marquette 22 and the Ann Arbor 7, uh, which actually kind of sister ships. You can see they're very similar in construction. Um, and uh, I, what I love about this shot too, is you can just really get a sense. Um, they would really uh, load one boat at a time. You didn't have more than one switch crew working the boats at any given time, but you would have multiple boats arrive at the same time on any given uh, train crew shift. So neat shot, another publicity shot from 1953. So a lot of paper ran east uh, on the Green Bay and Western, and you can see some of the FA ones there as well. And so just commemorating that with an old 40-foot uh, uh, boxcar there. And uh, here, again, another uh, publicity shot. But they're actually unloading passenger cars here from the Ann Arbor um, for Green Bay and Western. They're going to run what they call the Miller Specials, which was a special tour given to shippers of the Green Bay and Western line, which ran all the way across the state of Wisconsin. And so these passenger cars are being used uh, for this special course being switched out by one of the FA1s of uh, the KGB and W. And now we're getting to some of the classic power in 1957. So here's the RS11 309, which would later uh, have a chopped nose. And you can see some of the GBW reefers being loaded into the Ann Arbor 6. And uh, here you may notice that the boat is actually tilted a little bit because when they were loading the boats, they would actually list from the weight of the train cars and the bridge or the apron would actually take that and be able to adjust to it. A lot of my uh, friends uh, say that I should be listing and tilting my boats on my layout, but I just don't know how HO track and fast track switches are going to respond to that too well, but we may have to experiment a little bit. Here's another shot from 1952 and we're on the top of one of the boats and you can just see the yard. It's pretty empty on this day. But notice how there's a long string of cars coming in. So the crews would actually uh, either pull the cars as a string or load them as a single string. So you can see that uh, taking place. And it looks like it's one of the, uh, the RS2s, the 302 is doing the switching on that. Here's another area shot from 1963. Again, the yard's not very full in this publicity shot, but you just have one boat in, um, one of the Pierre Marquette boats. Um, maybe the Flint. And uh, you can also notice that tracks nine and eight have no cars in them, which basically means that they're still pulling the cars from the boat. In fact, if you look to the right, you'll notice that you have a, a pair of engines sitting there, uh, RS units with a couple of cars that they probably just pulled off the boat and they're going to be backing them into the yard. Uh, here's one of my favorite shots. So this is uh, the number 310, which was an RS-27. This is actually the first RS-27 produced. Notice the brake wheel on the nose. That was the only RS-27 with a brake wheel uh, like that. And it's uh, switching out the car fare. And then also uh, up above, you'll notice that there's a crane sitting there. And I've got a pretty lengthy description here. So this is July of 1966, photoed by Mike Dunn. Um, so you've got um, them loading the boat. It's an boat. And they're loaded on auto racks, 
uh, from the yard track four. And then you also have a PH crane on one of the flat cars. Uh, while well, the other flat car has a boom section. So they did haul all kinds of stuff over on the boats. These PH cranes came from Harnsflager plant in Escanaba, Michigan, and then they were routed from the ELNS from Escanaba to Channing to the Milwaukee Road to Green Bay, and of course hit uh, the Green Bay and Western to Kiwani. Um, so they could not go to CNW out of Escanaba because of low bridge restrictions uh, somewhere up in the UP. Um, but uh, Dan, one of the GBW guys I reference, uh, he believes that almost all went to CNO, hence the small gap between the crane and the boxcar behind the trine levels. They were probably moving on a CNO boat later that day. Sometimes there would be three to four flat cars with more boom sections on them. Uh, it's a great photo with this activity. Uh, you also have a GNW GN double box car, which is probably a load, a lumber load sandwich between a DTNI and Wabash cars. So I'll just go back to this picture. You can see on the right there the DTNI box car, the Wabash, and then the, the lumber load there as well. A lot of lumber held, was hauled on the boats. Also to the left, you can see slip one, which doesn't have a boat uh, docked to it at this point. Here's a, a neat shot. So this is one of the RS-20. So it was an RS-3 uh, that had chopped nose that was rebuilt uh, by GBW. And this is 305, which was the first one actually modified. You'll notice that it has great trucks. So it was an experimental paint scheme for GBW uh, to have great trucks that didn't last too long. And the three other subsequent RS-20s had black trucks, uh, like all GBW engines after uh, this period. But you'll notice, uh, looking back towards uh, the BN grain car there, that the boat is very much listing as they're loading it. And you also notice that there's a flat car and a gondola in between the engine and the cars because you did not want to put the engine on that apron on that bridge, otherwise you would collapse it. And this has happened a, a few times in the uh, operations. Here's another shot of 305 uh, loading the Atchison. Here's a few boat trains running. So the boat trains ran between Green Bay, which would be the Norwood Yard, uh, the main yard between Green Bay and Western, and then run down to Kiwani. So just a kind of a sampling of different uh, boat trains running in 1974 and 1975. Also that bottom right picture of the 317 behind it is the Viking, uh, very nice shot of that boat. Notice a nice pickup truck there as well. Here's a couple of action shots as well from 1980 and 1975 of the boats uh, being loaded. And you notice that that 320 unit on the left is getting pretty close to actually being on the apron over the water. That's about all the farther uh, they would ever go. Here's a nice shot of the yard. So just to kind of explain where we're, what we're looking at here. So you had the seven track yard to the left, you can see the ladder track. And then to the right was a track that led to both slips. And I'll be showing that a little bit more clearly as we go. But here you got the uh, C424, the 320, uh, switching out the, the cars and uh, basically categorizing them, getting them ready to go on the boats. And here's a nice shot of the first run of the 313, which was, had a special paint scheme. Um, and that was its first run down to the ferries. And then sadly, these are pictures of the last boat train that ran. So it ran on November 16th, 1990. It marked 98 years of car ferry service out of Kiwani, which of course was the first uh, port of call in Wisconsin. And uh, it was the Badger that actually was the last boat running under MWT. A little bit later, the Badger would be bought and converted over to hauling automobiles across the lakes. Now the Badger still has the tracks underneath the asphalt. Uh, on the deck, but you wouldn't really put many cars in anymore because they've kind of got a double deck type thing going to get more automobiles inside its massive car deck. But here you can see on the bottom right is the Badger sails out of Kiwani uh, for the last time. So why did this car ferry stop running? Well, we're really computers. <laughs> um, things get a lot more efficient uh, around and through Chicago and basically solved the bottleneck. And so it became a whole lot cheaper to just route cars around Chicago, even if it still took a little bit longer versus running the boats, maintaining the boats, all the labor of the boats. Um, also CNO and Ann Arbor, which owned the boats that ran into Kiwani at this time, just wanted to span the service. GB and W kept trying to keep it going. In fact, in the eighties, there was a lot more cars heading east than were coming west because GB and W were trying to keep the service going where CNO and Ann Arbor were trying to get out of it. And of course, labor costs and then old equipment. The boats were getting old. A lot of these have been running for, for 50 years, uh, 40 years uh, at this point. 
So let's talk a little bit about the Kiwani Car Ferry operations. Here's a promotional uh, flyer. You can see that aerial shot on the right again. So GBW was in charge of loading and unloading the boats at Kiwani. So both the CNO and Ann Arbor ran boats to Kiwani, and this allowed interchange to both Ludington and Frankfurt in the Lower Peninsula. There were two slips and seven tracks, as we said. One of the interesting uh, operational things is there was a yard limit uh, mile post. It was a uh, mile post 33 and a half. Uh, out of Norwood, and that was the interchange point for the Ann Arbor and CNO. So as long as the GBW got the cars across that yard limit sign, they were considered to be interchanged at that point, even if they were still sitting in the yard of Kiwani, even if they had not been put on the boats. So the Green Bay and Washington had great interest to get the cars past that yard limit before midnight each night. GBW normally ran two trains. So you had train two and train four coming out of Green Bay, night train and day train. Train two would return as train three to Norwood and Green Bay. It would run upwards of 100 cars. And most of these cars were cars from Western Interchange. Remember, Green Bay and Western ran clear across the state to Winona. And so it would interchange with the uh, BN and CB and Q at that time. Um, and this night train would switch out two to three boats. You also had train four, which was the day train, would you train as day train one. And it would normally have only 20 to 40 cars. And most of these cars were local traffic from Green Bay, the city of Green Bay itself. They would run extra trains uh, to handle extra traffic if warranted. And there were a few times where they'd actually have a full yard of Kiwani where you just see a couple of engines and a caboose running, they call it a caboose hop. And so that would probably be kind of fun to see as well. Here is a timetable for what we're talking about. So the westward bound, you can see train three, train one, train three of Pierce leaving at 11.59 p.m. and train one leaving at 12.45 uh, p.m. So you got one basically at midnight, one in the afternoon, and then train, uh, train four will come back at 7.15 a.m. and train two will come back at 8.50 uh, p.m. So you can see the the time difference there, the night train and the day train. So when crews arrived at Kiwani, having come from Norwood, they would arrive and first cut off the cars they brought with them. And if they had time to block them into tracks three and seven, they would. Um, and they would block them between empties and loads and also between the Ann Arbor Road and the CNO Road. So you basically had four different types of blockings going on. Empties, loads, both for Ann Arbor and CNO. And then they would try to make up their setouts for each boat. And then when the boats would arrive, they would move uh, immediately to unload them um, using three to four empty cars as idlers, basically those cars to span uh, the gap so that you weren't running the engines on the apron or inside the boat. Then these unloaded cars would be put on tracks eight and nine, which are the two tracks uh, closest to the lake. And these cars would sit for their return trip to Norwood in Green Bay, the yard. They would then load the boats with priority given to loads that had been left over from the previous shift or from the previous boat train and then loads that they brought down uh, with them. Empties also ran across because if you ran a load, you ran the empty back on the boat as well, but empties had lower priority. The tricky thing here is that boats would need to be balanced. I mean, they're boats after all, and these railroad cars are quite heavy and the weight can greatly vary. So a conductor on his way down in the caboose from Norwood and Green Bay to Kiwani would actually calculate these things out and figure out where to put all the cars on the boat. And then he would check it out with the first mates of the boat to uh, make sure everything was good with his mathematics and stuff. And then they would basically repeat this operation for each boat coming in. Crews could switch out two to three boats uh, on a given shift. The interesting thing is Kiwani, the yard itself, did not have room to block or sort the cars coming off the boats. All this was done in Norwood. So basically, after they unloaded the boats, those went to tracks eight and nine and just sat there until they ran back to Green Bay. So what did it look like to switch out the boats? So here's a nice night shot of the Pier Marquette 22 um, getting ready to be switched out. So switching a boat took no more than an hour and a half. Um, and this is, of course, after the cars and semis and passengers were off the boat, then the railroad would usually take an hour to an hour and a half to unload and load. Um, here's a shot of a car deck. So I'm actually doing 3D models of these. So this is a, a rendering of the 3D model that I'm doing. And a couple of interesting things here. So you had number five turnouts inside the boats. You'll notice how the center tracks actually fan out a little bit um, as they go towards the back of the boat. And those are called the center tracks. 
And then you have the two wing tracks on the edges of the boat. Notice the guardrail, how far around it goes. This is actually prototypical, and that's just to protect the outer wall of the boat because if one of those cars decided to come off the track, it pretty much take the car uh, ferry wall with it. Um, they also had very specialized long frogs with a very long guardrail, but they were number five turnouts inside the boat. Also interesting, if you tried to run any car over 50 feet on the wing rail, you had to take it really slow because the 60 foot cars would get really close on clearances to uh, the car deck walls. Here's another rendering of the, the 3D modeling that I'm doing. And so you can see the four tracks uh, on the boat and then of course the car deck walls. And so these were just very, very large inside. And of course there would be track bumpers at the end, which I don't have modeled or shown in this model, if you will. So as I've mentioned, weight was a huge issue. Uh, the boats would list a lot if they were not properly loaded. One boat did flip, although that happened in Michigan and Manistee did not happen in Kiwani, but it flipped and they actually uh, cut a hole in the side of the boat and took the railroad cars out with a crane, uh, put a new plate back on the boat and flipped her back around. Um, the wing tracks were always unloaded first, especially if they were loads. And if they were loads, this would have to be done a half at a time. So you could have anywhere from five to six cars on that wing track, but you might have to take two out and then go to the other side um, and take another two or three out and then go back to the side you started on, take the rest of them out and then go on the uh, second side and take the rest out. So you'd have to go back and forth, back and forth, really managing the load and not just uh, the load left to right, but also um, from the bow to the stern so that you didn't want to leave a lot of cars just on the bow and then raise a stern up huge. You wanted to really keep it balanced. So just a lot of things to keep in mind for the switch crews. And the first mate of the boat would be checking everything. In fact, the first mate would give the instructions to the switch crews uh, how to unload the boat because he was there when it was loaded. He knew what were the loads and um, empties were, what the heaviest cars were. So the first mate would basically be directing the switch crew in the unload what to do. And the railroad crew had to give deference to what the first mate was telling them. Here is a uh, shot inside uh, the city of Green Bay. And you can see on the right there, on the other side, you can see some Sioux Line box cars and a grain car there sitting there. And if you look where it's washed out in on the apron, there's actually a, a line of cars coming because when they loaded, they would load the center tracks, then the outside wing tracks. So they basically load the opposite way they unloaded. And here's a very interesting shot. I can't quite figure this out because you've got a stack of cars on the wing, but if you look to the left, there's nothing there. So these are definitely empties, but this is definitely not a normal way of loading or unloading a boat where you just have cars on the wings sitting there with nothing else in the boat. Because if you were loading, you put them in the center tracks first. <laughs> if you were unloading, it'd be the wing tracks pulled first. So this just shows that even the model railroader unloads my boats in the wrong way, the rear road probably did it that way once as well. So as I mentioned, the center tracks would be unloaded after the wing tracks. And the center tracks would usually be done in one pull unless there were extra heavy loads. Um, they did haul some cars that were extremely heavy, like bentonite clay cars for the paper industry coming east. Um, also did some coil steel cars. Um, so every once in a while you had some really heavy cars that you might have to double pull a center track as well. Um, some of the heaviest cars were clay cars, cement hoppers, fertilizer hoppers, coil steel cars. And a lot of times these had to be unloaded by themselves. So one car would be unloaded at a time, if you will. The boats also did haul tri-level and bi-level uh, auto cars, high cubes with auto parts, 86 foot, uh, you know, the big high cubes um, could be put on only on the center tracks. And as, as I said earlier, if a 60 foot car was there and you'd have great care, but if it was over 60 feet, forget it. It's going on the center track because it would never negotiate the curve of that number five turnout without hitting the car ferry wall. And here's a shot of a, a car ferry all loaded up. I love this picture because you see the bi-level with the Jeeps uh, sitting in there. And this is actually the Viking right after she got refurbished. And just look at how clean it is. Just absolutely amazing. You can also see the paving on the tracks on the stern here where you could park automobiles as well. And here's a shot from the city of Midland, one of uh, a favorite boat of a lot of the, the boat guys. And here you can see the Kiwani docks from the passenger area of the city of Midland. One interesting note about this picture is notice the flat car with the automobile frames. So this is a bit of a misnomer because 
there were automobile flames that will come across uh, from Michigan uh, to uh, Green Bay and Western for the Minneapolis uh, Ford plant. But this is actually in the load tracks. And so there were auto frames made, um, I believe in Southern Wisconsin and oftentimes will come up and then get put on the boat and head west instead of always heading east. I also love the engines with the uh, old uh, red and gray paint scheme coming at us as well. So a little bit about paperwork. So it depends what era you do. If you do the pre-80s era, of course, it's all waybills. Each car had the waybill, of course. The conductor would make his own switch lists and cut lists on his, in his caboose on the way down from Norwood to Kiwani. And then he would also create a wheel report at the end of the day that documented when cars went past the yard limit and what was done with them. And that was kind of the handoff document to the next boat train that would be coming down. And then post early 80s, you would have the computer switch list, which took place at waybills. You had faxes going on. But GBW still used a lot of handwritten forms. And then, then they had to be entered, as many say, the GBW ran on forms. And here's an example of two of those forms. So on the left, you have a form that was used as your yard list. So this would be what the conductor would fill out to just uh, figure out exactly what they're doing in the yard. And to the right was the train list that would list all the cars in the boat train coming down from Norwood to Kiwani or from Kiwani to Norwood. So here's some interesting car movements that happened on the car ferries. So you'd have 65 foot gondolas with steel, steel sheets and I-beams. Um, you had a lot of New York Central, Penzi and other Eastern Railroad gondolas that would come across heading east. You also had a lot of coil loads, uh, DT&I, Ann Arbor and CNO coil cars. And uh, these would run exclusively on the CNO boats. The Ford Fast, this was a really interesting uh, operation, but they would haul auto parts from Michigan to Minneapolis. And the GBW had to get them to Winona um, in the evening at a certain time in order to make the interchange with the Milwaukee Road. I believe they uh, had to get them by there by midnight. Otherwise, there was huge penalties. But you had a lot of these auto parts coming. And those were the hottest cars on the GBW when they were running the service. It ended uh, right before the 1970s. But uh, these auto park cars, you have New York Central, Penzi, DNH, DTNI, NNW, CNO. Interesting enough, CNO coming on Ann Arbor, um, 86 foot high cubes in the pool, uh, tri levels and bi levels, um, open frame ones, and then the semi enclosed ones, which is the sides, but the open top into the late 70s, and then the auto traffic kind of dwindled. You had a lot of cheese. I mean, this is Wisconsin for crying out loud. So the cheese plants in Green Bay uh, would haul cheese and reefers across the lake. Um, you also had meat from the packing plants. You had Manoa butter. You had milk powder from AR Strum Company in the 60s and 70s. And this was a good chunk of traffic. You had canned goods coming from the Green Bay area in both 40 and 50 RBLs, but also 57 foot mech and uh, plug insulated box cars. GBW did not have their own insulated box cars. So you saw PFEs, SPFEs, and BNFEs. Uh, you have the clay cars, uh, bentonite clay, which was used in the paper making process, specifically in the Byron and Wisconsin Rapids paper mills. Sadly, that Wisconsin Rapids mill is just announced to be closing at the end of the month, 900 jobs, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of consolidated paper, consolidated paper company out of Wisconsin Rapids. They use 70 ton minimum boxcar, but usually 100 ton boxcars, a lot of GBW boxcars for the coated paper rolls. Um, and then Procter & Gamble mills out of Green Bay hold a lot of paper uh, heading east on the boats. Also a lot of covered hoppers on the boats. You had a lot of soda ash and two bays, a lot of fertilizer and cement hoppers. A fertilizer would be in Ripside and uh, cylindrical hoppers. The cement hoppers were some of the heaviest uh, cars on the boat. A lot of Ann Arbor DTNI of Dundee. Uh, you saw a lot of malt, soybeans, grain, oats that went to Manitowoc on CNW, but interchanged at the uh, yard in Green Bay. So you actually kind of had to head a little bit north and then CNW took them south. Another interesting, uh, really interesting operation was the Green Bay Soap Company um, had their own tank cars. In fact, Athern has made them where you see uh, Green Bay soap on them and they would haul tallow, which was used in the soap making process and then also covered hoppers of tankage, which is a nice name, name for ground up bone meal that was blown in. And then they also uh, hauled cow hides, moved in the oldest box cars they could find. I can't imagine what those uh, cow hide cars smelled like in the railroad car ferries. 
You had eastbound lumber from the BN, Milwaukee, and CB and Q heading all the way east on the Green Bay and Western across the state. They'd be hauled on bulkhead flat cars, 40 foot box cars, and then towards the end using 70 foot center beam flats. Interesting enough, the 70 foot center beam flats only could put those on the center tracks, and only about three of those on any given center track with maybe a 50 foot car behind. So those took up a lot of space inside the boats. So I want to talk a little bit about modeling uh, car ferry operations. So just another shot of the uh, some of the models that I'm making. So on my layout, so I'm doing more of a proto freelance, if you will, on my layout. But uh, the whole statement, if you will, is what if the car ferries never stopped running? I'm a young guy. I never really got to see the car ferries run um, 37 years old. So I want the car ferries running now. I don't really, I hope no one's offended. I'm not a big roof kind of guy. I'm a young guy. I like modern equipment. So I want to run my car ferries, but with modern equipment. So what I'm thinking is what if the GBW never stopped running boat trains? GBW never got bought up by Wisconsin Central, but basically became a bridge line to the Wisconsin Central and Stevens Point and then interchange with the Wisconsin Southern Railroad. So basically, I get to run modern cars, whole bunch of awesome Elkos, a lot of awesome SD45s and SD40-2s. And scale trains, if you're listening, why not Wisconsin Central SD45s? Some of us are a little bit bummed. Reasons. Um, for me, well, it's a very unique operation in history. It's a real niche in my local operation group. No one else is really doing car ferries. It's a way to preserve one of the most unique railroad histories in the Midwest. It's a combination of my favorite railroads and era uh, and a believable concept, Wisconsin Central, Wisconsin Southern, GBW, and of course the boats. It's uh, heavy prototype switching operations with lots of beyond the layout opportunities. It is a model railroader's dream as far as track plan and operations. And then it's an awesome project to explore 3D printing and provide models to others and increase interest in the car ferries. So on my layout, the boat related traffic, I have other things going on in my layout as well, but the things that really relate to the boats is I have two paper mills on my layout that take clay cars and push a lot of paper out. Of course, a whole lot of Wisconsin Central uh, pulpwood flats, 3D printed. Um, I have an auto plant run by Wisconsin Southern uh, with MP15s, pretty cool. And they're taking a whole bunch of boat parts uh, from the boats, uh, car parts, sorry, from the boats. And then I'm also shifting modern auto racks to the boats uh, and then coil steel loads as well for my stamping plant. I'm running fertilizer cars. Uh, they did run silica sand, so I can run some sand car type things and a lot of food products via online and offline customers. And then who, for, who can forget the cheese? So for me, in every given session, the GBW is going to run two boat trains. But instead of coming from Norwood, they're going to come from my WCR, kind of like the quote-unquote Stevens Point. And then they're going to run to Kiwani and back, just like they did. And just like you had those Ford Fast trying to get to Winona on time, my uh, GBW trains will have to get to WC, yard on time. And then Wisconsin Southern will run interchange trains to pick up the new cars from the Wisconsin Central. And then Wisconsin Central will do most of the switching on my layout and they'll be bringing all the paper cars and everything to my different industries to the WC yard. And of course, GBW will pick that up from there. As far as the Kiwani operations go, I'm going to have like a first mate slash yard clerk. So I'm combining these two jobs. And so they're going to give instructions to my railroad crews, unloading and unloading the boats, which would be very helpful for first time uh, boat ferry operations, people that can just be instructed how to load them and why they'll load them that way, just to create some interest there. And uh, a whole lot of things that you just never have to do in any other kind of operation. And they now have two boat train crews, uh, but they're run independently of each other. Um, they'll have to follow the instructions of the firm and yard clerk. And then all my paperwork will be generated through GMRI. So I'll be doing the post eighties paperwork uh, type process on my layout. So here's just a little video um, of my Kiwani. So my Kiwani Peninsula is actually prototypical. All the switches are in the right place. I did have to compress it slightly, uh, which in HO scale is about a three foot compression. But the peninsula itself is 14 feet long. And I just shot a little bit of a video here um, to show you. So I've got a, a boat train coming out. To the left is tr track eight and nine. You can see I have a train sitting there with unloaded cars from the car ferries already with uh, two R's 27s. And the interesting thing about this yard is you actually have this kind of bowl within a bowl. Uh, we have a bunch of Y's inside here and I'm actually heading to track four now 
to pick up some cars to load onto the ferry on slip two. So again, in my yard, I have a mix of modern cars. So Wisconsin Central, GW, Wisconsin Southern running, if you will. So some high cubes, I'm running the high cubes with paper products. Some of the boats did have car decks high enough to be able to take high cubes. The ballast cars are not going on the boat. So then we pick up the cars. So this would have been pre-blocked by the crew when they arrived. So oftentimes you would work in four to five car cuts for each track. So that's basically the amount of modern cars you can put on the boats, sometimes six. A lot of these older boats were made for 40 foot cars. So they could haul 28 to 30 cars, but with modern cars, they can only do like 20 to 22, if you will. So as we're pulling this out to the right, you can see I've got two car decks sitting there. They're not full ferries yet, we're still working. Um, but we got slip one right to the right of us with the black deck. And then we're gonna be heading towards slip two here to uh, drop off these cars. So I do use all servos uh, for my turnouts for fast track turnout. Fast tracks, I use Tam Valley to fire those, just love the Tam Valley products. And I'm just doing a 3D printed mount. The reason they're on top of the layout is because I can't mount them underneath by myself well. So since I have over 120 turnouts on my layout, it's easier just to put them on top for now. I can always move them. So as we come onto uh, the car ferry, you can see this track gets uh, very close to the water's edge. And there's actually a number six Y on the apron itself. And so I've already loaded the wing tracks. You can see that I've got half of the center track. I got some coil steel loads there, so it's not a full, a full track at this point. And we're just backing in now. Out of laziness, I was just pushing it by hand. And as we pull out, you can see that I've got two gondolas that I've been using as idlers, and I'm just on top of one of my GBW engines with the camera. And as we pull out, I'm gonna actually pull out on the rightmost track, which is the, the double slip track. And uh, it's independent from the yard lead. So you can actually pull out differently if you will. You gotta run around there between the slip track and then the yard leads. Here we pull out. Passing in the track to slip one. And then you can see yard lead. So I'm actually on a track right of the yard leads. Now I got crossover that just in front of us to get in between both tracks. And then just to show you a little bit more clearly what this looks like. So this is laid out very, very authentically uh, based on the blueprints of the yard. So basically the guys I've talked to have operated the yard basically tell me you run, I can run exactly what they ran. So they'll tell me how they ran the trains. I can come down here and do it myself. Which is awesome. There we go. So just as a little plug, um, I work with the SS City of Milwaukee, which is the last world car ferry in present, uh, it's in preservation. It's basically as it was uh, when it hauled cars ending in 1981, but it definitely needs your help these days, especially with the coronavirus stuff. And I really encourage you to go see it in Manistee, Michigan. If you wanna to donate towards it, uh, donate a gallon of paint. It's a, a huge project to keep it going, but just an absolutely beautiful boat. It's open for tours. They have a boat tell, you can actually stay on the boat Everything's original to the 1930s, absolutely incredible. Uh, here's a couple of shots I've taken on the boat itself. You can see the car deck as it was, uh, pilot house. Uh, the lower right is the engine room actually where the boat was controlled from. You've got the Chadburn telegraph still there with all the levers to control the steam engines. Just an absolutely beautiful uh, treasure that still exists. So I just encourage you that if you wanna learn more about car fairs, it's a wonderful way to be able to do it. Also, the SS Badger uh, store runs to this day as well, and you can take that across the lake. 
uh, between Manitowoc and Ludington. So I don't know if there's any questions, but that kind of ends my uh, PowerPoint presentation here. Carferry.com. That was, that was great. Thanks, Tim. Um, so we do have some questions, <laughs> which we'll run through as, uh, as the guys uh, assemble for the round table that's coming next. Um, but uh, just, Randy, if you could just mute for me, um, oh, that would name. be great. Yeah. But anyway, um, okay, Tim, so Randy, could you just mute for me while we just do the last clinic? Thank you. Okay, so sorry about that, Tim. So the first question comes from Speed from outside of the Helix, um, and he asks, uh, was there anything to prevent a car from rolling over the edge of the loading ramp when the ferry wasn't there? Uh, no, no, I guess you could do that. So there was no protective gate, no bumper there when the buffer wasn't uh, there. It was clear into the clear into the lake. Wow, I've never um, done that. Before. Pete asked, um, "No, no." <laughs> uh, Pete asked, uh, "Was there a dedicated spacer car used when pushing the cars onto the apron?" Um, he noted one in the picture, um, and there was a loaded gun with what appeared to be weights. But was there a was there a custom spacer car? That was a good eye. So the Ann Arbor, uh, the Grand Trunk, and the uh, CNO did use dedicated spacer cars. A lot of them were just shop builds on the Michigan side, but the Green and Western did not have idler cars. They just used empty cars, grabbed whatever they wanted, and went. So GBW never used dedicated idler cars where other railroads did on the Michigan side. And we do have an old Ann Arbor idler cool. car on the boat right now in Manistee, Michigan. Wow. Um, Norm Cattell asks two questions. The first one uh, was, is there a car ferry modeling group that you're aware of? Um, no, actually, I'm not aware of one. There you go, Norm. That's an opportunity. Um, well, I'd like to have question. models, but uh, I'm, I think I'm one of the first to actually really 3D print in a serious way uh, the car ferries. So a lot of guys have made them on styrene and balsa wood in the past. There's a lot of fine models out there. I have a question on the 3D printing. Mm -hmm. Are you printing the whole thing in one piece or is this in multiple pieces? So right now I'm printing in four pieces, but I'm actually in the process of building a 3D printer that will have a 16 inch by 64 inch bed, which will allow me to print a car deck in one piece and the car walls in one piece. So um, that's where I'm headed. Um, but right now my printers can do 16 inches by 16 inches. So I have to break it in four. And so I'm doing that basic prototype. I haven't actually completed a full boat yet, but we're getting very close to having one fully done. And then I'm going to get the new printer going and we'll go to town. I've got a number of guys who have ordered them already. We have a we have a good guy in Australia who's good at printing big things. We can put you in touch with him. That'd be great. I'd love to uh, printer. Um, um, okay, and then Norm's second question was, uh, he's starting a layout based on Manitowoc in Wisconsin, and he wants to build a car for, him, for his obsessions. Is there any suggestions on where to start? Because he's not found much uh, on building a HO scale car ferry. So um, he can definitely get in touch with me. I have a lot of resources that way. Um, but actually, being that he's in, if he's in Manitowoc, the Manitowoc Maritime Museum has a lot of plans in that. But you definitely want to start with a set of blueprints. That's really key, depending on what boat he's planning on modeling. And then there are a lot of pictures out there if you kind of know the right people. But if he wants to try to get in touch with me, I'd be more than happy to get him into the right resources and that that way. We have a few um, we have a few questions about your layout. This is what happens mm -hmm. when you show a video of your layout. Yeah, um, it's, 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 it's as humble as it is right now. <laughs> it's great. I, I see great opportunities there for remote operations. So um, we're doing Dave, it. David Nicholson. Um, asks, uh, what are the servo mounts you've used? They're 3D printed. I just whipped out a, a servo mount in like 15 minutes in Fusion 360. So it's just a quick 3D printed mount that I made myself with the calipers. Nothing special. Well, 15 minutes is pretty special. Um, oh, it's simple. Most people can't do that, remember? Well, when, I, when I'm doing counting rivets on a boat and making rivets in sea channel and stuff, making a servo mount's pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> you have a missed career in naval architecture. Yeah, um, so um, this person uh, 
is clearly from Wisconsin. This is their. Oh, okay. uh, I don't know their name, but I know the name of their YouTube account is Cheesehead Media. Love it. And uh, they say, "Where did you get the X LSI ore cars for the Green Bay and Western used ballast?" I made them. Those are 3D printed, and my clinic on Friday will show how I made them uh, using a Cricut cutter and 3D printer. So my next two clinics show the process I do. But if they want to get a hold of me, I do have those available uh, as a kit. So, um, but yeah, that's a 3D print project I did a couple years ago. Awesome. And Andrew Porter, who'll be joining us in a wee, wee while for the roundtable, um, asks, uh, why did you mount your uh, turnout motors on top of the layout? Really hard to do it upside down by yourself. And uh, my layout is kind of temporary. I, I get moved uh, kind of quickly. So I don't really have a plan on syndicating this layout at this point. So I just want to get trains up and running, make it quick, be able to adjust things easily and doing things over your head when you can't see what you're doing is for the birds. So that's why they're on top. I may paint them silver, but uh, that's why they're on top. Just to I, I, I see 3D printed things that go over them in your f near future. Yeah, it would be a lot of 3D printed things. So I'd have to really be creative when you got like seven of them in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly there's, there's a lot of little huts appearing in that yard. <laughs> a lot of storage required. <laughs> there's a lot of, a lot of storage. Yeah, a couple porta potties too. I don't know. I sent you some pictures of the docks in Orkney. There's lots of little huts there for the fishermen and all kinds of stuff. So yeah. you can get away with it. Not me in the middle of a railroad yard, but hey ho, never mind. And yeah. and so that was all of our questions. Um, Tim, that I've got uh, from while we were doing the the session. If you've asked a question just then, I won't have caught it. But uh, uh, I'm sure Tim is back uh, twice. I think uh, for two more on friday so uh please tune in for those clinics uh that was a really good introduction to to tim's fantastic modeling so uh thank you so much for joining us tim thank you for sharing and uh, we'll see you again on friday thank you so much appreciate it